James Connolly. Patriotism and Labor. From the Shan Van Vogt, in August 1897. Transcribed by the James Connolly Society in 1997. To read documents that influence these audios, please visit the Marxist Internet Archive. What is patriotism? Love of country, someone answers. But what is meant by love of country? The rich man, says a French writer, loves his country because he conceives it owes him a duty, whereas the poor man loves his country as he believes he owes it a duty. The recognition of the duty we owe our country is, I take it, the real mainspring of patriotic action, and our country, properly understood, means not merely the particular spot on the earth's surface from which we derive our parentage, but also comprises all the men, women, and children of our race whose collective life constitutes our country's political existence. True patriotism seeks the welfare of each in the happiness of all, and is inconsistent with the selfish desire for worldly wealth which can only be gained by the spoliation of less favored fellow mortals. Viewed in the light of such a definition, what are the claims to patriotism possessed by the moneyed class of Ireland? The percentage of weekly wages of one pound per week and under received by the workers of the three kingdoms is stated by the Board of Trade report to be as follows, England, 40, Scotland, 50, and Ireland, 78%. In other words, three out of every four wage earners in Ireland receive less than one pound per week. Who is to blame? What determines the rate of wages? The competition among workers for employment. There is always a large surplus of unemployed labor in Ireland, and owing to this fact the Irish employer is able to take advantage of the helplessness of his poorer fellow countrymen and compel them to work for less than their fellows in England receive for the same class of work. The employees of our municipal corporations and other public bodies in Ireland are compelled by our middle class town councillors, their compatriots, to accept wages of from four sterlings, to eight sterlings per week less than English corporations pay in similar branches of public service. Irish railway servants receive from five sterlings, to ten sterlings per week less than English railway servants in the same departments, although shareholders in Irish railways draw higher dividends than are paid on the most prosperous English. In all private employment in Ireland the same state of matters prevails. Let us be clear upon this point. There is no law upon the statute book, no power possessed by the Privy Council, no civil or military function under the control of Prime Minister, Lord Lieutenant, or Chief Secretary which can, does, or strives to compel the employing class in Ireland to take advantage of the crowded state of the labor market and use it to depress the wages of their workers to the present starvation level. To the greed of our moneyed class, operating upon the social conditions created by landlordism and capitalism, maintained upon foreign bayonets, such a result is alone attributable, and no amount of protestations should convince intelligent workers that the class which grinds them down to industrial slavery, can at the same moment be leading them forward to national liberty. True patriotism seeks the welfare of each in the happiness of all, and is inconsistent with the selfish desire for worldly wealth which can only be gained by the spoliation of less favored fellow mortals. It is the mission of the working class to give to patriotism this higher, nobler, significance. This can only be done by our working class, as the only universal, all-embracing class, organizing as a distinct political party, recognizing in labor the cornerstone of our economic edifice and the animating principle of our political action. Hence the rise of the Irish Socialist Republican Party. We are resolved upon national independence as the indispensable groundwork of industrial emancipation, but we are equally resolved to have done with the leadership of a class whose social charter is derived from oppression. Our policy is the outcome of long reflection upon the history and peculiar circumstances of our country. In an independent country the election of a majority of socialist representatives to the legislature means the conquest of political power by the revolutionary party, and consequently the mastery of the military and police forces of the state, which would then become the ally of revolution instead of its enemy. In the work of social reconstruction which would then ensue, the state power, created by the propertied classes for their own class purposes, 
would serve the new social order as a weapon in its fight against such adherents of the privileged orders as strove to resist the gradual extinction of their rule. Ireland not being an independent country, the election of a majority of socialist republicans would not, unfortunately, place the fruits of our toil so readily within our grasp. But it would have another, perhaps no less important effect. It would mean that for the first time in Irish history a clear majority of the responsible electorate of the Irish nation, men capable of bearing arms, had registered at the ballot boxes their desire for separation from the British Empire. Such a verdict, arrived at not in the tumultuous and, too often, fickle enthusiasm of monster meetings, but in the sober atmosphere and judicial calmness of the polling booth, would ring like a trumpet call in the ears alike of our rulers and of every enemy of the British imperial system. That would not long survive such a consummation. Its enemies would read in the verdict thus delivered at the ballot box a passionate appeal for help against the oppressor, the moral insurrection of the Irish people, which a small expeditionary force and war material might convert into such a military insurrection as would exhaust the power of the empire at home and render its possessions an easy prey abroad. How long would such an appeal be disregarded? Meanwhile, there is no temporary palliative of our misery, no material benefit which Parliament can confer that could not be extorted by the fear of a revolutionary party seeking to create such a situation as I have described, sooner than by any action of even the most determined home rule or other constitutional party. Thus, alike for present benefits and for future freedom, the revolutionary policy is the best. A party aiming at a merely political republic and proceeding upon such lines, would always be menaced by the danger that some astute English statesman might, by enacting a sham measure of home rule, disorganize the republican forces by an appearance of concessions, until the critical moment had passed. But the Irish Socialist Republican Party, by calling attention to evils inherent in that social system of which the British Empire is but the highest political express sign, founds its propaganda upon discontent with social inequities which will only pass away when the empire is no more, and thus implants in all its followers an undying, ineradicable hatred of the enemy, which will remain undisturbed and unmollified by any conceivable system of political quackery whatever. An Irish socialist republic ought, therefore, to be the rallying cry of all our countrymen who desire to see the union and triumph of patriotism and labor. Editorial Note Whilst in full sympathy with Mr. Connolly's views on the labor and social questions, we are absolutely opposed to the scheme he puts forward for the formation of an Irish Republican Party in the British Parliament. Any conscientious Republican would stick at the oath of allegiance and no reliance could be placed on what John O'Leary calls double-oathed men. John Mitchell allowed himself to be returned as a representative, but absolutely refused to entertain the idea of claiming his seat. He looked upon his election merely as a declaration in favor of his unalterable rebel principles. We would like to have this question debated.